Welcome to another episode of the Twisted Tubs podcast. I am your host, Stephen Tuberty, a.k.a. Twisted Tubs. She is Tristan Risk, a.k.a. Little Miss Risk. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast, Tristan. It has felt like thank an age since I've... No, oh my God, thank you for coming <laughs> on. feels like it's been an age since I've actually spoke to you. But um, what I've been keeping tabs, as we all do, you know, on the Facebook and the so on and so forth. But uh, yeah, it's great to actually sit down and talk to another like normal human person, you know, in, in the flesh, as you would. Well, video, video scale flesh. But yeah, nonetheless, how have you been and how are you doing I have, uh, well, you know, I've been doing as well as can be expected given uh, the global situation. I have not fallen ill, nor has anyone in my immediate circle, so I am happy for that. Um, I know that's uh, not the majority of people right now. Um, But that aside, I am doing well and uh, safe, happy, healthy. Um, No complaints about life in general aside of the usual curmudgeonry. How have you been doing? Um, I've been I've been doing I'm homeschooling like that's <laughs> that, that has been a very different process I might add um, it's um, it, like the older one Grace she's not so bad she kind of goes up and does her zoom calls throughout the day but it's the twins that are, are trying to get them to sit down and actually do like letters and everything else and sounds and so on and so forth because they're only four um, yeah that has been the challenge like that has um, showing me that like man I miss a film set so much like <laughs> <laughs> I haven't been on a film set in like about a year and I was kind of going like, Jesus, it just goes to show like, I'm like how fast that year went. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I think I've been doing a little better in this lockdown than I did in the first two. I kind of think I went in myself and regressed a bit because, because you know, uh, us being creatives, I don't think, I think having the creativity like that I was used to having and the freedom, I think I'm not taken away. I think in a sense kind of like drove me a little mad, you know, and I, I, I had to kind of like readjust and, you know, reset the, the wheel, if you will, and then just kind of figure out like, okay, how, what am I going to do to keep myself occupied? Because, you know, you've met me. I I mm-hmm. can't sit still for two seconds. I'm a very bouncy, you know, young fella. So it's, uh, I say young fella and I'm old. Oh, actually, one thing I will say to you, Tristan, is since the last time you saw me, right, look at the amount of grey in the spirit. Oh yes, you're getting you're One getting the year. sorcerer streak. That happened since <laughs> lockdown. Like that happened since the pandemic. Like happened. Bang. Um, Those are the 2020 follicles. Yeah, I'm, and I'm I'm thinking I should leave it. I think I should just like you know like grow it and like, grow it in and just have this big grey gruff on the front because apparently it's you know, I can call it my Nick Vince. Yeah, That's there you go. There, there I go. There's a silver lining in everything. <laughs> Silver lining, um, silver beard, you know how it is. <laughs> distinguished, I've heard, I don't know. <laughs> but um, yeah, so I mean, as as any guest I have on the show, I always kind of start off with the first question I want to ask them, and that is, uh, Tristan Risk, tell me your origin story. Now, I don't mean uh, when you were a young wee two-year-old or whatever else, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> I just mean like, your, your, when I say origin story, I mean is like, what was Tristan Risk like? Like? as a person growing up and just what kind of developed you into, you know, the, the actress, the, the burlesque dang, dancer, the, the mermaid, the, just the, the, the creator, <laughs> like what formed that? Like what was that journey that got you to where you were now? Um, this, this origin story starts uh, with the child of a single parent and later that single parent got uh, a really good partner early on. And um, I had the benefit of a really awesome upbringing. And I don't mean that in the terms that like my parents gave me everything that I wanted or I, um, you know, uh, it was all rainbows and roses. It's just, I've seen um, a lot of people who have not great upbringings, not great family dynamics or structures um, that they're uh, surrounded by. And I think one of the things with this pandemic um, that we've seen is that like we're spending a lot of time with our families and how that can really affect how we start out. And I really for a long time took it for granted that my family has been so awesome and supportive and, you know, don't always understand why I'm doing what I'm doing or what I'm doing, but they, they, they support me and they give me their, their backing. And that's like, you know, I wasn't beaten. I wasn't abused. I wasn't, there was no incest, you know, like. Unique upbringing. 
However, I didn't get the crap kicked out of me at school and being bullied because like being like that self-confident little weirdo that I am, um, you know, like other kids take one look at that and they're like, fuck that person. <laughs> We're going to knock her down a peg or two. And I was also a small kid. So I was easy to pick on because I was like, like easy, like, you know, locker size kid just like fits right in there. So um, being weird didn't help um, then but I was an only child and because I didn't really care for the company of other people, I mostly preferred the company of animals. Um, I'd fuck off quite frequently to the beach and <laughs> like had a, a, a funnel with a hose that went into the ocean and would play my recorder so that the whales could hear the music, the orcas. Yeah. Cause I was that kid. I was like, yeah, they can obviously hear me. Sound travels so much faster in water. The orcas can clearly hear me and appreciate this recital. <laughs> Probably not so much. <clears throat> so I spent a lot of time. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I was going to just say, so I spent a lot of time in imagination town, you know, when, when you have that kind of world. I mean, and, and as you were saying about, about the, the, the upbringing there, so I, mean, I, I can relate to that because um, like you've, cause you've met, you've met my sister Bex, like she's been yes. set. So like, you know, like, like, like we're two, we're two wired kids, but we were the same. We were just very same. We had like a mom and dad, that, like, you know, if I told them I was going to have to like join the circus in the morning or was going to have to just be an astronaut or whatever, they'd be like, yeah, okay. As long as you're happy. You know, we had a good upbringing. We had a good kind of, you know, kind of a good family unit as well. And I can mm-hmm. totally relate to the school thing because I was like, like the tiniest guy in the class, you know. So it was like <laughs> it was easy to just pick on me. But I think looking back at all that, I think as you say, was we like was we. I think over time from talking to you and stuff and just getting to know you and and being able to call you like a friend over time, it's like I think we really are two just two weird kids that grew up to be cre- like massive creators in our own rights and in our own kind of lanes, you know. So I can totally. Yeah. It's it's totally like as I said before, and I and I said to my daughter the whole time is I said, don't like just don't change for anybody. Just you know, if you're weird now, you're going to be weird when you're older. It's just not going to change, like you know. So just embrace it now while you have a chance, you know. But um, yeah. So I think yeah. it, it molds you, Tristan. I really do. I think I think the life there and and just the things you do, like going to a beach, trying to talk to the whales, you know, probably mm-hmm. led to why you know, the the mermaids. And stuff later down the road. It's 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 all stepping stones to where you're meant to be. I think it really is. And um, I, something I think you can definitely mention to Grace too is when I was in that point, like I basically rejected my peers because, um, again, being an only child, I spent a lot of time with my parents. So uh, you know, like if they had kids, they'd make me go play with them. And I'm like, why do I have to hang out with that guy? Why can't I just hang out with the adults, like the like the rest of you? So I didn't really get along with people my age at that point. And um, then when I hit about like 23, 24, I started dating somebody and I did like a fundamental change in myself. And it's at that point that I started like, you know, drinking and uh, doing, experimenting with recreational drugs and what have you. Because the person had said, you know, like, we're in this band and, um, you know, the fact that you don't do any of these things, like, kind of makes it weird and uncomfortable about it. And, like, I'm judging them and I probably was because I was that age where I'm just like, I don't get this. So was, I was told, I was basically encouraged to to party and I was rewarded for being, like, the crazier I was, the more people were like, oh, they loved it, right? So, I mean, I went through a really long phase of that where I was like, People don't like me when I'm just like normal, boring, sober Tristan. So I would go crazy. And I mean, that was really great for getting out of my shell and making a lot of crazy art that I would have not necessarily made, but it was all part of the path of just kind of exploration of uh, being a performance artist at that point. But now (laughs) I've gotten back to that point where I could... Uh, like I'm just completely fucked off about other people in general. Like you know, um, the 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 desperate attention for people who try to kind of um, do things for the sake of likes or hits or views outside of a business model, unless you're doing this as part of your profession or to add to your um, to your projects. The the seeking other people's approval um, or wanting to have influence over them is. Um, you know, it's not an attractive thing about our species. And I've actually been even considering getting like some body modifications 
to my face to actually guarantee I will never work as an actor again. But, you know, I haven't gotten quite there yet, but, you know, just, you know, I kick around the idea from time to time. Yeah, but see, I think, I mean, as, as long as I've known you now over the last few years, um, it's, it's, I think, I think that's, that's the best, I think that's, that's the best uh, way of, 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 of your character in general is just like, you know, it's just, as you said, no fucks given, man, just, you know, I do what I want and I, I run my own journey and I am interested in risk and fuck you, you know, it's, and I love Pretty that. Much. I do love that because it's a balls to the wall attitude, Tristan, you know, and a lot of people, like, I mean, for the longest time, I was very like that as well. I was like, oh no, I can't upset this person because, you know, you know, they might not like me, you know, and, and then, as I said, you ran about the drinking thing a while ago. Um, I, I gave up drinking like almost five years ago because, now one, because my body wasn't like, it was like, this is how it was for me. It was like, my brain was like, you're 21, get loaded. And my body was like, you are going to fucking pay for that. I'm going to make you sick for five days. <laughs> and, that, and I was having five day hangovers and it was just became a point where it's, I can't drink anymore. I'm just done with it. Um, but then, as you said, you know, nobody likes you when you're born, Tristan. I had, I went through that same phase where I was like, oh, people don't really like me as much anymore because I'm like, you know, boring, sober tubs. But then when you stop to think the amount of work you, you actually have done and the on you know, the point of time when you stop, if you're going, oh, wait, I actually was way more productive in the time frame that I wasn't doing this, you know? Um, it's so it's true. insane. It's actually insane. Yeah. But, and I think uh, something else I realized too was the turning point for me was I want to do so many things with my body. Stupid, ridiculous, um, outlandish things in terms of the capacity for uh, stupid human tricks so in order to do that I have to I feel and I probably am very unique in this uh, thought among the sideshow community I have to take better care of my body than most because I'm going to potentially be putting it through more shit like for a period of time when we were on tour because I wasn't getting a chance to shower I was doing an angle grinder act where I would uh, strip out of my my outfit and then Burns would uh, use an angle grinder to shower my nearly naked body with uh, oh. uh, sp with sparks and that's like little flecks of metal um, and they'd go into my back and you know if I I'd brush them off to the best of my ability but sometimes they'd like get in there so like six months later when like we have not toured in a long time I'll be like scratching my back and I'm like what is that and I'll pull something out it's a like tiny little piece of metal it's like oh that, that was in there Ooh, oh my it's God. Finally grown it's, out. So you've like sh shards of it still in your back well just like they're tiny like little microscopic bits right and it's like when you exfoliate like they just kind of like in that layer of of skin they're not harming any it's probably not doing me tons of favors but they're not harming me in any way right but just when it's like, oh, what is that? What is that? And it's like, oh, when was the last time I did that act? Oh, that's been a while. <laughs> I, I, I love talking to you about things like this, right? Because, I mean, I'm, I'm, the, I'm the guy that, like, for eight years of my life did, like, backyard wrestling. You know, I mm -hmm. wrestled and I yeah, yeah. off things. I remember I got powerbombed on the bonnet of a burnt-out car um, with oh. tongue all over it. I still have oh to like... And now, I mean, I, I haven't wrestled in years. And I had a conversation with my friend Tim Horrigan on, on one of the shows recently. And, I was, and he was saying to me, he's like, you know, because he used to wrestle with me. And mm -hmm. I was even saying that it is like that thing because I still have this like dragon in my, my head that I'm chasing and, like 16 years later. And I know in the back of my head, Tristan, that my body hasn't taken a bump it hasn't you know as you were saying about you haven't toured in a while so it's like how would your body hold up when you do it now i'd be like that and, and i'm going to but i'd get back in that ring and i'd go one more match if i thought i could do it to end it on my own terms because i remember i got injured and have to kind of like stop doing it um, and mm -hmm. then i kind of put it put silver linings and doors open one way and the other when i got injured i fell back into the acting and then you know i got to meet you and nick and patty and all these cool people by doing that so, you know, there's, there's a switch on it, but yeah, even like, just like looking at all the things you, that you have done, because like you have a massive CV when it comes to like the film side of the industry. You do. Like, <laughs> I mean, like you can pat yourself on the back because you know you have, <laughs> but um, yeah. So like, I'm just 
curious, like, because I've seen, obviously, I've seen your stuff and I've been on screen with you and, you know, for like, even if like that snip and that was one of my prouder moments, but we'll talk about that in a while. Um, <laughs> but you know what I mean? I've, I've gotten to see a load of your stuff and I've really kind of like enjoyed all your things. And, you know, as I, I think I've, I've told you the story, I think the first time I saw you on screen was in American Mary. Mm-hmm. as Beatrice and I was just blown away but like, at, at, with the character I just love the character so much because like you know it's like you see if I'm in a film and you see it it's like oh there's Tubbs or if I see you in a film I'm like oh that's Tristan in this role but in that role like that's not you and that's amazing to me like you know I had one other time in my t- two or three little times one in the parish where it wasn't me on screen and for but for me the Beatrice one was just this was amazing. So I just wanted to tell you that, that I really, really loved your performance in that movie. But the question I I have is, how did, how did Tristan Risk end up in that direction? Like what, what led to the direction into the film industry and how did you kind of like get from like the first film all the way up to like, like American Mary and Rabbit and all the other movies like Frankenstein created bikers and things like that. You know what I mean? Like, how did, Without being long-winded, like what was the starting point that got you there, like in that direction? Um, there was there was a couple catalysts. The first was in 2010. Um, I quit my old band that I used to tour with, <clears throat> and that was a big lifestyle change for me because I had done that for like six years. So that was a huge shift, um, and I was kind of having this moment of like I don't really know what to do with. My, like I'm still doing burlesque, but I'm not doing like like being away half the year on the road. So um, I got involved with uh, some smaller film projects. And then uh, my friend Kevy had introduced me to the Soskas. And that was the first door. American Mary opened a lot of doors for, well, every door. I'm going to be honest. It opened every film door for me. I would not have the film career I have if not for that film and that role, because that really gave me a huge uh, advantage um, where otherwise I would have probably had to work a lot harder um, for a lot longer. Um, and the other interesting thing to note about that, and this is why it's really important to never say any to anybody like you're finished or you're, you'll never do that because it's actually like the complete reverse curse. When you do that, it almost practically guarantees that that person will do the thing that you it has said that they'll never do. Um, when Ginger Snaps came out in theaters, I went to go see that with my boyfriend at the time. And I remember watching it and I saw Catherine turn into a ginger and she like looked so cool as this like hot half um, werewolf creature. And I saw that and I was like, oh, that's fucking cool. I want to fucking do that. I just, oh man. And my boyfriend rolls his eyes and he looks at me and he's like, you could never do that. And I just thought it was an interesting like little twist of serendipity that of all the people I would work with in close capacity on my first film that gave me any kind of notoriety would be with Catherine on American Mary. So I, I let that that's an interesting twist in my origin story point. So <laughs> something worth noting anyway. And, and it's, I think it's a fantastic twist because as you said, you're sitting in, in, a, in a cinema hall watching Ginger Snaps. And mm-hmm. Catherine's in that movie, and you're like, oh, I would love to do something like that. And you get the eye roll because I can honestly say, as long as I've been doing this, um, I can I can honestly say the amount of times I've been told, oh man, why don't you get a real job? You know, oh yeah, get, why are you doing this like your know, silly hobby thing? And I'm going, man, to you, it's a hobby. To me, it's everything, you know? Yeah, you know, like I, I just heard a point that Burns brought up because he's been my my partner has been doing this his YouTube thing and um you know every, everybody gets a little bit of flack when they're when they've got their own hustle whether you're in the arts or you're uh, a content creator or um you know anytime you're trying to do your own thing there's people who will be like well that's not a real job why don't you get a real job and i think 2020 has done a very good job of d- showing that Anything you pay taxes on, it can be considered a job. And there is no such thing as job security unless you are able to create something for yourself. Now, I admit not everybody is able to do that. And some people are in situations where they can't. But as a creator, I resent when people say that because it's like, first of all, they're devaluing what you and I do. And second, and 
then um, on top of that, it's like, well, no, it is a real job. <laughs> so fuck you. Just because I don't work for someone else does not make it any less of a, a, a job. And I, you know, I heard that um, through Burns and that's something I really feel strongly about sharing right now to everybody who's like, oh, you know, I don't have a real job. Fuck you. This is a real job. <laughs> I mean, look, come here, you know it yourself. When you step on a film set, like there is no like, you know, oh, sure, yeah, we do two hours and we, you know, we fuck off. Oh, you're there until that grind yeah. is over. And that could be anything from like, you know, eight to, to 15 to 24 hours, you know. It's an insane yeah. process. Like, and I don't know about you. Like, I mean, like obviously you've had, you've had real jobs over, over time and like mm -hmm. I've had real jobs. But I don't think I've ever put in as much effort into things like I mean, I've I've sh I would I would have shown up for my nine to fives and you know like clocked in, did my job, go home, you know. Mm -hmm. But any film or any project or any any artistic thing that drove me in in like a happy minded wheel, um, were the things that would like got a hundred and fifty percent of my attention. And I'm very much in the ADHD bubble, so I'm not a lot of things get a hundred percent of my attention as you well know I'm so bouncy it kind of I see mm -hmm. what fine I'm gone you know it, yeah it's, it's that mindset but when you have the things that really drive you and really are kind of a part of your makeup and your DNA I think that's when your your best work comes out and I mean I think I can see yeah. that in your work and even your film roles your characters you know you can see it's not just you putting on a costume it's not just you jumping in it, it's you um, disappearing into the role if you will yeah it's it's also you know I'm working for myself in that respect because you know I am my own product as a performer so you know um, you're always going to be more invested in working for yourself and whether that's like as part of a film set because you want this film to be successful for whatever dog you have in that artistic fight or um, you know you're you're um, wanting to be successful in a in another capacity. Um, it's just it's it's so important to kind of like have that drive for yourself because you know you're never going to work for anybody as hard that you'll actually work for yourself and i know that it's like it, it reminds me of how like when i was working as a carney on the midway and they said that i had to help with setup which was all a lot of very very heavy heavy lifting to which i was not suited and i literally walked off of the midway and said i'm not doing this because this is i'm not working that hard for somebody else for so few dollars and I tried to get fired and they didn't fire me. Actually, that whole season I tried to get fired and they didn't fire me. So, I mean, I got really obnoxious. <laughs> but I also didn't do any of the heavy work. I'm like, uh, I'm not getting paid enough to do that. So, I mean, that's why you will never work as hard for anybody else as you will work for yourself. Exactly. And I do believe that. I mean, to, the, to my honest to God core, I'm, like, I'm, I'm nearly 40 years old. And I was kind of going like, you know, like I spent nearly 20 years of my life, you know, like, Locking into a machine that you know you know yourself it's everyone does it you have to it's life you always have to have that job when you're kind of growing but i think as you get older you start to figure out like i'm here but i want to be there and yeah. like, you know this yep. is this is more entertaining to me but this pays my bills but then you have to get to a certain point where you just kind of go like you know all right well you know what paying the bills and you know, every you know, just doing this every day to pay bills i can find a way to pay bills over here you know and i think that's the thing but like, I mean, and it does, and you go that direction, you end up in, in a bubble of create, creativity and creating characters. Yep. Me and you, in the acting game, we've had the pleasure of creating a lot of different characters over time. But mm -hmm. the next question I want to ask you is, out of all the characters that you've played, off the top of your head, like what are, in your mind, when you sit back and you look at like the characters you've played and the movies you've been in, what fall into your lap as like your top three favorite characters that you've like you've performed or even a top five if you want to add in two more into that and go all all the way five okay i get five yay okay sweet okay well number one i would definitely say beatrice because it's the one started it all and it's the one that i would say everybody knows me most for so i can't not like that would just be silly to not like have her as one of my yeah. in my top three um the second one is val val in jimmy's in james bickard's universe whether it's frankenstein created bikers or whether she's in an amazonian jail val, val is one of my favorite characters to play because she's just so angry and yelly all the time and 
gives me an excuse to be completely obnoxious as a human being. And then I'd say number three would be Madame Pong from the Aliens Ate My Homework. We lost Tristan? No. Um, have, Did you ooh. lose me? We went yeah, I'm, you're here. Oh, no, you're here. Yeah, I... we're here. We're good. We're good. All right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I, um, I'll go back and I'll say that uh, number three yeah. would be Madame Pong. Um, and that is because the two films that she appears in, Aliens Stole My Body and Aliens Ate My Homework, are both originally based on books by Bruce Coville. And I grew up reading those books. And to be able to portray a character that you have a connection to as, you know, in your childhood memories, that was <laughs> so cool. Like, I don't like when do people ever get a chance like that? And it's such a neat character with so many prosthetics. And to be honest, when I had the makeup on and that she has these great big, long, beautiful pointed um, elf ears and these huge black scleral eyes, I was like, it's not fair that this alien face is hotter than my own real face. <laughs> so can I just keep this face all the time, please? I'll even have the big yellow bald head. I can make that work, but. Definitely, Madame Pong was a, uh, is a favorite. Um, and how I just have to ask you on that one, um, like the prosthetics and um, look insane in that costume. Like they really do. Like I mean, as I said, that's another one because when you think about it, I mean, as I said, as we talked about this um, before about um, obviously I have done the little bits and pieces on on Banshee. Mm -hmm. We mentioned already because you can tell I'm we, super we happy about that experience. <laughs> um, <laughs> where I got to actually be on screen with you as the as the creature, and as you know, later stage that that creature that was in that movie kind of morphed mm -hmm. into what became Killing in the Parish. But having done that kind of stuff now, like in like like really digging into that creature kind of prosthetic acting, um, like the process of like just like getting into the makeup and getting out of the makeup, um. It, like, I mean, obviously you said you had a connection to that character which I think is amazing um, mm -hmm. did that make the process easier for you like getting into that um, amount of prosthetics I, I think I think I'd always kind of pictured her speaking the way I played her like it's kind of it's incredibly self-indulgent to be able to say that I got to portray her the way I personally have always imagined her it happened to align with Sean the director's vision which is lucky, but it's also like, you know, oh God, you gotta like, oh, that just, mm, mm, it's a roll that around in my soul, just enjoying that moment. Um, so I, I really like to think that she shone through, but uh, the greatest part of it for me is just when you wear that much, much prosthetics, I feel like it's just so much easier to lose yourself into the character and to become that person. Like in Ayla, when I'm wearing such, minimal makeup or anything where it's like my own face like mother of Be the mother of beauty and it's like you know mascara and may and you know i'm probably going to be ugly crying in it anyway i feel so much more vulnerable because trying to act with my own face and all the nuances like i have so much respect for people who do that normally that i just feel safer inside the prosthetics that it's just like i can be pilot this you know and do you feel that also I, did, I mean, I genuinely did. I remember um, talking to Paddy um, more so on the parish because I, mean, I remember it because it was an entire suit and I was mm -hmm. in for hours. I had, <laughs> it was full suit for you. It was, it was, I mean, I think, I mean, I'm, I, look, I mean, I can say it. He probably won't kick my ass for talking about it too much, but um, um, I think, I think, I think what the lad said, I think it weighed an extra stone and a half. So I was actually carrying about a stone and a half of weight extra on on me and crawling around on the floor and, you know, um, it, it just getting into the process. But the, I found I did disappear into it after a while. Like I genuinely did find myself. I wasn't talking to people on set. I was, I was just in the thing. I was talking to Paddy, obviously, about scenes and direction and things. But when I was kind of out around in like my cool down time, I was in that suit, like practicing crawls and just, you know, and a little thing about that um, thing is I actually met, remember when I was trying to figure out how the creature would move, as you were saying about getting to play the character kind of um, like your own way, kind of putting your own stamp on it. I remember I watched like crocodile walks as me and Paddy had walked around, I talked about like how insects would walk, or crocodiles. And I remember mm -hmm. watching videos where they like on YouTube, they show like how um, insects walked and crocodiles and things like that. 
we landed with a low bass kind of like a shimmy. So, mm-hmm. but it was such a weird process. Like, you know what I mean, because I had done movies and and been on screen with my own face or prosthetics on or you know, like like SFX and things, but to actually be completely in it and then to see, you know, everyone else react to what you're in. You no longer mm-hmm. see yourself in that role. It becomes a, a different process. Monster acting, a like creature acting or creature performing. Um, you've done it because I've seen sitting on the biggest screen in Fright Fest. I got to see you on screen three times in Rabbit and I've seen, not to spoil anything for anyone, but there's a certain scene that you show up and I'm like, oh my God, that looks Surprise! unreal. You know what I mean? And, and for me to be like an actor that does that stuff as well, but to see you, someone that I like really kind of like, got to admire uh, your work over time and stuff, uh, to see you just pop up and kind of go, oh, look at that, that's real. You come out of the, the, the movie with a better feeling. Um, yeah, so like you named three. We rambled on here. Well, I rambled more than you did, but you named three. So you've got two more on, 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 on the list there. So Gosh. one of my other uh, favorite characters that I got to play uh, has been Veronica. And that was a very small role, but it was part of a really awesome uh, ensemble um, of the editor. And that was with the Astron Six guys. And I was a stan of those guys before I showed up to their set because I was a fan of Manborg and I had seen Father's Day, which if I has not seen either of those uh treat yourself it they're both really awesome super weird very enjoyable and, and um that it was based on giallo's really got a kick out of being able to be part of a neo giallo that, that, that with so many talented people like there's the astron six crew but they also got like udo here they had lawrence harvey involved like it was just it was a real treat to be part of that you know like it was kind of being like, oh, I got part to be part of a fish called Wanda, you know, like, oh, yeah. like it's a, it was a big fucking deal to me. So I was, uh, I was very excited to be part of that cast. Um, and then I would say for my, my last role, um, I really liked playing Ayla, um, you know, title character, you know, big ego stroke there, give my ego a little mas- massage. Um, but also that was, that was one that was a challenging role for me because again, I'm not using prosthetics. I'm having to really use my face and I can't, I have like no lines. I make some noise, but I don't say anything. So that was fun to have a challenge as that, as an actor. So those two um, roles, very different, um, but also just my main face and out of drag. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> um yeah we, uh, no, we just snipped there i think it's probably either my side or your side internet it's just it's canada to ireland so we're bound to have one or two hiccups you know bouncing back and forth but um conservatively no, i play with wizards yes <laughs> i know i just wanted to ask you another question right it's it's on it's an interest it, it's more for me than it is anything else because i've always wanted to know this because i can't phantom it because even even as an actor You've obviously, you know, over time, you know, because you do the burlesque dance and everything else, you've done some forms of nudity on screen. And the reason I ask mm-hmm. this, this isn't about oh, Tristan's naked on screen question. It's because I've done it once and it was just me and a camera. And I swear to God, I was breaking it. And there was no one else in that room. So like, like I just, did, do, you, do you have a confidence towards that? Or do you always find that to be just a weird scenario in general when, 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 you are, when it's asked of you to do that? Um... I would say that coming from the background that I have as someone who's very used to being um, in forms of naked or nude on stage or on on film, um, it's not something that bothers me or has bothered me. Um, there has been a couple sets where it's been uncomfortable for me, and that wasn't my nudity. That was other people's reactions to my nudity that were less than professional and i mean that's a law of averages if you are someone who uh takes your clothes off or appears um without them in in capacities a lot of people will uh you know most people are respectful some people don't know how to react um and that can be anything from unintentionally uh, uh, offensive or offended to, you know, yeah. intentionally. 
Um, but most people that I've worked with have been, you know, professional about it. And because we're there to produce an overall image and it's not about, you know, bits and bobs and this and that, because, you know, it's just, uh, it's, it's weird to think because I'm like, everybody's just like a really complicated it's electrified jelly in our heads and so <laughs> to get funny about genitals I've begun to take a very insect-like approach to the whole thing where it's just okay. like sort of uninterested in them and you know like until I am sexually interested in my my sexual partner uh you know they're pretty much kind of just like you know it's a car without an engine running it's just sitting there it's not anything to be projected on i'm not going for a drive if that makes any sense does that oh no does of course it? It, it's, it just becomes part of the, of the gig it's just the job mm -hmm. well, and the reason i asked is because um like i've always kind of because you always kind of seemed very very confident in like the, the, the modeling shots and stuff like that you know what i mean so it's kind of always wondering and and as bouncy as i am and as, as kind of like ah as i can be that's that's the part that where i go like oh god i i i, I crumble because i've no confidence in that side of it um, and I just wanted to ask because I, I didn't know if it was a it was a confidence thing or if it was just, you know, just like, as you said, looking at it from a different um, point of view, like an insect point of view or things like that. What kind of gets you over the thing? Because as I said, I did one and I was like just me in a camera. You know, so it was like in a room, nobody else. I was like, go, leave. This is the only way this is happening. <laughs> I think also to working as a stripper, um, which is different than working as a burlesque dancer. And I know there is a lot of burlesque dancers who will say they're one in the same. And while they share a lot of similarities, there's also a lot of differences. And um, so working in that capacity and then being on set, people, um, like I say, people behave differently. And the fact that people have that nervous, weird response to my nudity gives me like an advantage over them. Whereas most people will be like, oh, she's naked. Like, you know, oh, poor thing. It's just like, I know this is upsetting and off-putting and all I'm doing is existing right now. So the <laughs> it's a lack of vulnerability on my part. And it's a small bit of delight in the other people's discomfort at at that, which just kind of increases my comfort and increases their discomfort. So it's very difficult to describe, but it's this sort of um, contrary nature I have where I'm like, oh, it's this, it's, this is all I have to do to make you uncomfortable? Oh, well, well then, off That's it comes. Super well, in its it own is. Really, isn't it? You look at yeah, it that way. Like, yeah, I'm, yeah, it's just. I'm sure some people can argue that they feel that what I do is exploitative or I'm being exploited, but I have a a very difficult time seeing that when if the subject of said thing doesn't feel that way put upon, are they? I don't think so. So I'm, it's a choice I made to be there. And it's, again, it's a delight in making other people uncomfortable in that way. Well, I think it just adds extra flame to your character and the fact that you're able to do that and have keep you know, just keep your confidence and just be who you are in general. It's just an awesome thing. Do you know what I mean? And, and do you know what I mean? We're here talking about other things. And as I said, I just, that was just a question because it was more for me than anyone else because I just, yeah. I've always been kind of like, I don't know how to be confident with things like that. But what I do know confidence in, no, but what I do know confidence in is films because I've been doing mm -hmm. it long enough to know. And when it comes to writing and directing, and we also know, that Tristan has also written and directed her own stuff. <laughs> you know? so, so as I would like to call you, is just you're a jack of all trades in, in, or, or you're a handmaiden in all the boxes, whatever way you want to phrase it. You've just, you've got <laughs> so many wheels turning and things going on. Um, but yeah, so I mean, the, like, since we are coming to like the end of the show and it is like the, the, the meaty question that we all kind of want to talk about is, is your two films, because the first one was Paralytrix, right? Mm. One you, you yep. didn't star in that one. You literally just went and wrote and directed that, which, and that must have been a very different process, but your brand new one that you have out is Reptile House. Yes. So, yeah, just run me through them, because I'd really love to just, like, hear from, like, the person that created these things and just get their process and their whole overall experience in their own kind of creating their own thing from their own mind. So, yeah. Well, Paralytrix, what Parlor Tricks was uh, was written with the cast in mind because those are all people that I uh, have the pleasure of knowing in real life, 
and have had the pleasure of working with on various projects, uh, stage and otherwise with. And so when I wrote those characters, I was writing those with those people doing those characters in my head. So when I sheepishly approached all of them and said, would you want to do the thing that I wrote? They were all super cool about the situation and were like, yeah, we, we'll, we'll do that. And I initially tried to get my friend Topher uh, to direct it because I didn't think I could. Um, I've never been to film school and I was like, well, I don't know about lenses. I, I'm not qualified to direct this. Everyone's gonna be like, well, who was that actress that she is like fucking directing a film? So I had a lot of hesit hesitancy towards doing it and I kept trying to make <laughs> do it. I'm like, yeah, 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 like I've got a place set up for it. It's great. Like I've got the cast, I've got everything locked down. He's like, you really should direct us. I'm like, no, 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 I can't do that here. But like, I've got this set up. He's like, you're, well, you're pretty much like already doing the thing. And I'm like, okay. So <laughs> Topher and, and Burns and Jordan, um, who is my uh, a, uh, d d uh, director of photography, um, they were all really, really awesome and supportive of me. And it gave me the confidence to not only do parlor tricks, but then be like, ha, huh, I did this once and it didn't blow up and do this again. I'm, I mean, even if it did like explode in my face, I'm pretty sure I would have probably done that again because I'm like, the stove is a hot and I forget the stove's hot. So, um, but I did the second one and uh, the second one is Reptile House and that's more of a Neo Giallo, uh, feel to it and a lot of people when they saw parlor tricks are like oh that's cool like we thought it was gonna be like you know scary or gory because you know you're you and I'm like yeah I know <laughs> but like I just I don't have to do that all the time so with reptile house I wanted to go in a little bit more of a different direction and I love colors and neo giallo and um, when they when you do filmmaking you're always like what do I have to utilize in my toolbox, right? Like you're always like, like what do, what do I not have to pay for that I can kind of like work in there? And um, Burns and I have a lot of reptiles. We have a large collection of snakes, monitor lizard. And uh, so I kind of wrote something around our collection of reptiles, which I knew we could get away with showcasing because I know how much we charge to go on another set for those. So I'm like, well, I know the value of these. Um, and then I didn't want to be in my own film, so I kind of wrote this character of Thena with uh, my actress Shirai in mind, because Shirai is very, I don't want to say, um, uh, mannerisms of Jennifer Tilly, and I, I was really impressed by seeing her film Ramshackle Blues that she directed, and we've worked together on a number of other projects before too. You can see both of us getting covered in goo in a music video called Apple Pie by Crystal Precious. Is that um, what it's called, Apple Pie? Yeah, Apple Pie. So uh, there's, a giant, check that out. there's a food fight at the end that Shirai is part of. I'm getting covered in gold glue and uh, sprinkles and there's pies and glitter spanks. It's really, it's a good time. So we've known each other for a minute and uh, getting to work with her and direct her as an actor was super cool. And then my other actor, my other humor and actor, Jesse Inacala, is uh, an actor that I've appeared with uh, in Valley of the Rats. And uh, we've done stage shows together like Dragon Ball Z Live and uh, Game Over. And uh, he also is known for doing voices uh, on animations like My Little Pony, and he voices Soren in The Dragon Prince. So it's super cool to have like such a wide range of talent with just like two people in front of the camera. Very spoiled is me. That's so cool, though, isn't it? Just to bring other people in that, like you know, have done other like just cool, cool stuff like that, man. Um, mm -hmm. I, I love the process of. <coughs> excuse me. I love the process of that because. Um, I remember when I, because it, it just helps when you have a team that like you're very, you know, like um, used to working with and you can kind of, you know, like, because when I wrote the word as I said, and when I ended up like last minute, I ended up having to like do the main character role. Um, and after writing it, I was directing it as well. I was like, mm -hmm. Daddy, will you be my AD and do everything? Because I don't know what the hell is going to happen if I slide while I'm acting. So as, as well as I kept that ship together, Patty was kind of... Mm -hmm. We need a person like that. Patty was doing like 3,000 jobs in the background, making sure that like I could perform on screen. But like, boy, I could like figure out the scene we were doing and talk to Baz and, you know, things like that. It was just, you know, and, and roll it all around. 
So I started to have a team and, and, and I totally get it. It's so cool to have people you can genuinely just like rely on in the back to make sure that you can kind of do your job and, and pull forward. And with, with regard um, Reptile House, where is, I mean, because we all know like the pandemic hit and kind of <laughs> screwed the pooch on a lot of things, but um, what is the process and where, where, where are you at Reptile House at the moment? Well, the bite... Despite uh, pooch screwery right now, um, Reptile House has been submitted to about uh, 15 festivals internationally. So I know that we're kind of waiting to see like if in-person festivals are going to come back. But, um, you know, everyone worked really hard on it and I wanted to have her chance to sh get her shine on. So uh, we met myself and David Debusa, being my producer, um, sent it out there. So hopefully a couple of festivals might take interest in more eyeballs get to see it it's great you know it's like being on tour but i get to sleep in my own bed every night awesome that's so cool and are you gonna <laughs> like are you gonna look in and go do another one are you still just have you found like it has it given you that edge to go write and direct another movie are you well kind of um, well <laughs> 2020 is was full of folly because i had been approached in 2019 about co-directing a feature film called Stripcraft, which is about oh. uh, chaos stripper witches. Initially, I'd been approached as an actor, and then um, upon meeting the writer-director, um, Wilson, we we got on really well, and he's like, would you be interested just because, you know, you have lived experience as both stripper and witch, and, you know, I just would like a queer female voice in there. And I'm like, I, ha I have this thing. I can do this thing. However, uh, COVID was like, comes along and kind of slapped that down. We were waiting on trying to um, solicit budgets and uh, fundraising. And it's been very difficult in face of pandemic to comfortably raise funds when so many people are um, going through what they are for a stripper witch movie, <laughs> as cool as it is. Because with COVID, of course, now we're, tr we're trying to take precautions to we want to keep everybody safe and it's really important this film and how much close interaction it is like we can shoot around the the COVID to a degree but there's still a large number of like you know you want to have personal protective gear you want to make sure everything's clean and that's an added cost that's another blow to the independent filmmaker right now that's just like oh well if we want to do this you know safely which I do because I'm old school and I'm boring that way um, that means you've got to be able to pay for all the things to keep everybody safe right so we're just not there yet but that's one of the things that's in the works is strip craft as from a directing standpoint and then from an acting standpoint um a film red wings is uh trying to take flight which i will be hopefully acting in directed by kate kroll is that is that um is it the movie with the bat that's the movie that's with the bat hard. yes yes <laughs> <laughs> I remember I seen I saw saw some posts I saw some things um I think is is there a trailer for this There's no trailer for There's this no trailer yet. okay so it's just it's just the poster that went out um and so bats is an, is another one that's uh, you're acting in that right I'll be acting in that one yes That's unreal and one is and there's another one you have as well it's called anxiety I think Yes, Anxiety will actually be joining Reptile House in its application to hopefully get out there on the festival circuit come like with 2021. Um, but that was uh, from an acting perspective um, alongside Vancouver's Paul Anthony and directed by Blaine Therrier. Unreal. So yeah, I, I don't know I was... if uh, you know of the band The New Pornographers, but Blaine um, was part of The New Pornographers for years and years. So I knew of him through that connection, but I didn't know him know him. So it was really cool to be like, oh, I get to be in your movie. <laughs> Yay. And did you know what? Did you know the way you reacted like that is that is the same way I reacted on, on Banshee when, <laughs> um, when because I'm, I don't know if you know the process, I remember because I mean, obviously people wouldn't know this, but um, I was a massive fan of Tristan's and then Patty had like, hey man, Tristan's coming to work with us. I was like, what the hell are you talking about? Like, and he was like, Tristan Rest comes like, Beatrice from American Mary. I what? How did you do this? And then it became a thing of like, um, can I like even if I'm on screen for ten seconds, can I just be in the movie? Because I knew there was like obviously you know Adam was in a role and you were in the main kind of the Eon Banshee role and there was all these other things and I was just going like and like put me in a, a suit. I don't care. Just let me on screen. And then 
because Patty is a gent in that way. He was a, I noticed, my friend. Careful with you. Yeah, you know, he, he he's good people. So he was. I was going to go on a um, He was like, you know, I know, I'm really like excited to meet Tristan. So like, I'm just going to put you in the creature scene where she walks past, and then that'd be her moment. And I swear to God, I was like, man, awesome. <laughs> because you know, and then I got to work with Nick Vince as well, and um, in intervention, you know. And for me, I was. I remember even like talking to Nick. For anyone that doesn't know Nick, um. Tristan, you know Nick, um, mm -hmm. and he is just the like he's in Hellraiser as the Chatter, one of the scariest creations ever put on screen, and he, he is might the nicest. Be Hellraiser, but he's absolutely heavenly. Oh, he's just the nicest guy ever. Like, and I remember we were sitting down, and we're both in the same movie, and um, and I'm sitting there, and he was reading, and he's there, and he's there sitting there, and he's reading his book, and he's like, and he says my name in the English accent that he has, and it's just the cutest. <laughs> awesome thing ever. It's, it's the Tubbs thing he says and I'm like hey Nick I know we're in this movie together would you sign my Hellraiser um, DVD cube for me <laughs> because at the end of the day even though I'm on set with the man I'm still a fan you know what I mean because that, that never goes away you know always, you were always a fan growing up and you become a, and you're still a fan in the process um, but yeah. it's for me it's so cool that like, I got to like you know, I saw American Mary and, and I got to I got to work with Tristan and then like I saw Hell Reser and years later I got to work with Nick. They're for me like the, the reason I'm saying this is they're for me, they're the wins in this, you know. You know what I mean? Then all the page, paychecks can come if they need to down the road or whatever way. But for me, when you are creative, they're the wins. They're the things that like, mm -hmm. people you look up to and things like that. You know what I mean? But I think I've I think I burnt the air off you with this story before anyway, you know what I mean? But when like you, you came on set. Um, and saw me running around with a leash around my neck while Paddy was running me. That was the first time you met me. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, you know, that's about par for the course uh, how I, I meet most people. I mean, I meet most people the first time they meet me, I'm either like topless or they see me in a film when there's like an eyeball in my vagina or something. So, I mean, like that's kind of like the first impression. Yeah, it's par for the course for my life. I don't mind this. Definitely not boring. <laughs> and, and and I love that. I love, I mean, because you know, you know, people that they, they, it's always first impressions and things like that, you know, but I just think, you know, I mean, I mean, for me, their stories, I'm like, man, the first time I met Tristan Risk, right, I had a collar around my neck and Patty like walked me like a dog. Like that's a strange <laughs> story for someone outside of our bubble to hear. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So that's why I love it. I love telling these, these kind of weird stories because they're just, they're the meat and bones of, of, of your journey. You know, we get to have these <laughs> stories to tell. And, um, and as we're like, because I mean, I, I was going to break this off at, um, at, at the half hour mark and just kind of like split it into two, but like we're, we're, ramp, we're ranting on. So we might as well just go <laughs> a whole hog on this now. Like, you know what I mean? Because we're, yeah. <laughs> we're rolling, we're rolling. Um, but yeah, Every so bit I mean, of the hog. So just like, as we said, we've talked about the movie stuff and we've run through a lot of like all the short films and, and everything else. And, um, but uh, just run me through it, like, um, like the carny lifestyle with like, as, as you said, you've the snakes and, and you've done the mermaid thing. And, and I think I told you this story before about my daughter, like she was a massive fan of H2O, the mermaids on Netflix. Um, and then I was like telling her, I was like, oh, my friend Tristan's a mermaid. And she was like, what are you talking about? And so I'd like, sure. And she was like, God, is she a real mermaid? And I was like, yes, she is. You know, mm -hmm. it's like, you know, she does this. She's a mermaid. But like just all those things, because that comes under the creative bubble, as we spoke about before, of just, you know, as I said, you, you know, you tend to kind of fall into a lot of different avenues and just kind of, you know, just you don't fall into one lane instead, or you're like, I'll try this, 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 and this, and I'll go and do all these things. But like, I mean, because obviously the film side is it, it's, it, it's the same thing and it's all it's entertainment but it's a very different thing to the film so like how did you end up falling into that or were you in that before the film stuff um i was in that before the film stuff because the the stage came before the film and i had started out doing um burlesque and you know when i started doing burlesque there was like nobody doing it really there was like a handful of people in vancouver and then it started to gain popularity and as things like game popularity you're like okay well i've been in the game for a while but how do i differentiate myself from my peers so i started looking into doing more and more weird stuff particularly for my touring show because it's just like you know you're going through a lot of the same places and it's like well i want people to come out to see the show but like i can't just bring them the same show every time so have to switch it up and learn new things so i mean that started with like learning to fi spin fire tassels on my pasties to doing contact fire and i was like Oh, I like playing with fire. So that kind of started it. And then I started playing with the angle grinder and 
then I started walking on broken glass and then um, I <laughs> and then while I was doing burlesque in Vancouver my boss at the salon who was also a clown I uh, was dating a sideshow guy in town and they started a troupe and they convinced me when I had hair down to my butt they're like you're gonna do hair hang and I'm like I'm gonna do what now I'm like yeah you're gonna do hair hang your head like, well what she was doing was she was cutting my hair and she was doing this with the ponytail going, your hair is really long and I go yeah and she's like hmm and I'm like why are you doing that Christy and she goes because it'd be really good for hair hang I'm like cool What's that now? So what hair hang is, is when you take your hair and you wrap it around a ring and then you hang by your hair. You're suspended by your hair. Yeah. I've seen so that in so. circus shows before. Um, and does that not hurt like, or, like it your neck is an, it, It's a sensation you get used to. You get very used to doing your own braid and knowing where the, your alignment is in your spine so that you're hanging straight. So you're um, training yourself practically so. To kind of yeah. be able to take this spin and the pressure, like is it? Yeah, yeah. So because you, you don't want to have it, your 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 hair like your weight weirdly distributed on your scalp, right? Um, so that's that's what started it. And then when I started dating Burns, um, Burns had initially hired me to be in one of his shows before we started dating. And um, then when we started dating, I was kind of starting to withdraw more from burlesque and get more into the sideshow thing and it like you know i had come out of a really bad breakup and i did the the thing that all healthy people do which is find the freakiest looking guy in town and fuck his brains out um and yay me and you, you uh landed you know, a winner <laughs> i did and then um it just turned out we had like a lot of uh, similar interest in doing human stupid human tricks with each other and um in 2015 uh that fall we formed a a troupe called the Caravan of Curiosities, which we still have. And uh, that's kind of like a collective where we're sort of the anchor um, units of it. And then we just bring in different talent and stuff. So, cause we appreciate like not everybody wants to dedicate a hundred percent of their time to um, these types of shows or tours, but we often get approached for gigs. So we kind of uh, do a bit of agency work. So where people like, well, I need uh, a guy with a sear wheel. And they were like, well, okay, we know three guys who do that like you know how much are you willing to pay kind of thing because we won't even bother our friends if like people aren't gonna pay the fee kind of thing but burns also comes from carney stock and he was touring with the carnival when he was like 17. so i mean he's he's like legit carney he, he's not like one of these like fake carnies and because you know a lot of that lifestyle is similar to touring as a performer or a musician um, there's a lot of overlap in lifestyle. So, I mean, the lifestyles that we were both used to are both like ones that we just kind of fell in together. And that was while I was doing film, which is essentially when you go do location work, you're just going and setting up like a little, they literally call it the circus, right? So, I mean, yeah. it, we're all, we're all just carnies at heart, all of us, I think. <laughs> you, you know me, I mean, I've, I was never part of the circus, but I mean, I wrestled and that is, that's carny life in, in another. 100%. It is such a carny, carny thing. It's, I mean, like, as I said, I mean, like, who would naturally, you know, like, allow themselves to be powerbombed by a six foot four guy onto a, 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 like, the bonnet of a car with thumbtacks spread across it? You know what I mean? It's, I mean, mm -hmm. you have to have, like, something missing up there or just a love or an appreciation for that style and life and design that that craft has. Because, you know, we have a wrestling show, uh, me and Brian O'Regan. Mm -hmm. You've met Brian. Um, I and, have. And we, it's called Retro Wrestle Chat. We kind of, we basically take matches from the old days. And we, you know what I mean? So, you, like, if you go in the comments and you write something down, so like, oh, pick Hulk Hogan versus Ultimate Warrior from WrestleMania 6 or something. <laughs> we, look at, we look back at it, like, with our older eyes and see where it lands and does it, you know, do we still think it's a good match? Because, you know, nostalgia can be a massive thing. Well, and now you know. we know a lot more about what's going, what was going on behind the scenes in wrestlings during that time. So it's or like you're watching, up. yeah, you're watching these like wrestling matches, and you're like, there's all the things that these people were going through on top of doing these perform these yes. these matches, and uh, you you have more of a pure appreciation for it because a lot of them went through a lot of shit. There's a lot of stories that came out of that world, you know. What I mean, good, bad, or indifferent. You know what I mean? And it's probably the same with with the 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 circus kind of um design as well. 
Do you like people that would do like high high best or or you know, acrobats and things? It's probably horror stories from that as well and things. You know, because that's just the lifestyle. It's it's a very you know if it, like in the in as you call it, the norm society, they look at it as like oh man, that's just a weird thing that people do. It's not. It's 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 yeah. like you going fucking twenty four hours in a in an office. That's weird to some people. You know, I mean, this is just the norm to people. It's well, it goes back to like the work ethic things. A lot of people think uh, you run away and join the circus, and it's uh, you're you're escaping responsibility, but you're not because you have to work so hard when you're you're showing up, putting up your tent, um, going to town, doing your load in, you know, setting up the ring, whatever your whatever your um, your busk or your performance is, and it's it it's just you can't do it if you don't have that drive. And that's why, I mean, for me personally, I don't, I have a little less drive as a, a touring performer these days because I don't have quite the same energy. So that's why it's been nice for me to kind of have that pivot with film where I can produce something where it's all the energy and excitement of the show, but it's beautifully edited, well lit, there's good sound. Every seat in the house is a winner and you can make sure that people actually see it because there's nothing worse <laughs> to do those tours and you're like hey, there's three people yay you know something i've always said i mean if one and it just comes out obviously obviously the, the goal is to fill the house you know fill every seat make sure everyone's there but um mm -hmm. i mean i remember we when we when we were doing the backyard stuff i mean sometimes there was three people just standing there but those watching people would get the best you know? show of their life though yeah, that's because, the thing I mean, I mean, even if three people show up, I'm like, you are getting all of my attention. I remember there was these, there was two lads, and they weren't wrestling fans at all. And um, there were just two of our mates that came down to kind of like, you know, like watch what we were doing because they, they were, to them, they were kind of going, like, what are you doing every Sunday? I'm like, come down and watch us. Just come down and see. <laughs> and they don't watch, they didn't watch wrestling, so they had no idea. But I remember in this one spot, there was this, like, you know, um, I don't know, do you know the roofs in parks? They're like about 20 feet in the air, they're like the gazebo roofs. I remember like mm -hmm. at one point um, I hit my friend Tim on a table and laid him there and then climbed up along this gazebo roof and then like you remember did you, have, you, have you ever seen or heard of Jeff Hardy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hardy boys, he used to do the swanton bomb where he would jump forward and kind of like spray his just spray outwards and I remember doing that through the table and the lads were kind of going like fuck is, like what are you doing like why would you do that to yourself and, I was, and then I, I realised I was like alright Ed not everyone gets it you know not mm -hmm. everyone gets the process and mm -hmm. the reason I'm I'm talking about wrestling here and this this crazy thing about people not getting certain things, but you know, finding a craft and designing something that's your own and just being super stoked about it is you gotta talk about it, Tristan. The nuns <laughs> just talk to me and about them. They're so <laughs> amazingly cool. like they're just so cool. I mean, as and I I don't know, has anyone ever said this to you? I probably have in a text or something, but um they, they remind me of those like or like those pink or purple dudes from the labyrinth that like switch their heads off um yeah <laughs> it's it's ridiculous how, how like every time i see one i'm like oh my god that looks like labyrinth so talk to me about that tell me about these guys because they're so cool it's funny you mentioned labyrinth because that is my all-time favorite film um hands down when everyone's like oh what's your favorite film and people are like i don't know i can't name it i'm like labyrinth not even a hesitation not even this not even a beat um hugely influenced by uh, the work of Brian and Wendy Froud, who were the art designers for Labyrinth, as well as Jim Henson, um, who was just amazing at collecting great talent to work with. <clears throat> so those were heavily influenced and part of um, the none such as come from being stuck inside for quarantine of COVID and not being able to perform because COVID came and wiped out all of our bookings and all of my film plans. And it was just, it was a little bit of a kind of like, okay, I'm a big girl. Everybody's suffering. You know, I'm not going to cry. Like, it's not that I can't do these things. I just can't do them right now. Pout, pout, frown, frown. So then I, uh, I, had to do something with my creative energy. Um, so I started doing the nun suches. And uh, when I started doing the nuns, such as my friend Scott was like, oh, you know, like we should do a, a, like a little photo shoot for them in the garden by my house because he was my neighbor. And I was like, well, we can do a social distance photo shoot. That's fine. And then he's like, oh, you should, you should do a little book about them. And I was like, eh, maybe, maybe. And Burns was like, yeah, you should do a little book and write a little thing. And like you could do like little pictures. And I'm like, oh, 
perhaps. So once again, the, the, I, I was very well encouraged to, uh, to follow through on this project. So um, in, as well as making all of these nun suches that have kept me wonderful company and have been a uh, huge um, help for me, my mental health. I also have wrote two books during uh, booklets during the pandemic. Not even one, you wrote two. You know what I mean? And it's only been a year when you think about it. I mean, like, you know, it's been a long year, but man, that's like you designed a, a brand new line of creatures with your own brand, your own name, and two books. Like, if you do nothing else for the next year, you've done enough. <laughs> you know what I mean? That is impressive, and, and that is so cool. Yeah, I, feel like, I feel like I'm doing okay. Like, I've got one, one of my guys here. This is the baby Krampus. Oh, show me. So, Have you named him or her? Well, this. Well, this one's just, it's a baby, right? So around Christmas time, there was a uh, baby Yoda everywhere. So I was like, well, Krampus was probably a baby at one point. He's got his like little beat down stick. He's got his little snack. There we go, look. Oh. <laughs> oh, he has a friend to talk to. Look at that, Tristan. Oh, look, that's just so Watch friendly this, now. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's creepy. <laughs> it is it, it is creepy, right? It's yeah, supposed it's to be cute. And it's like, you know, your, one's, your one's cuter. I, yeah, mine's, mine's cuter because it's quieter. That's the thing. That's the trick right there. When it says that, you can go, oh, look at that. It's brilliant. But it starts talking back to you like this fella. <laughs> yeah, I'm wondering if there's going to be, if Groku's going to be the most popular baby name in 2021. <laughs> I mean, it, it's up there, like, isn't it? Like, to be fair. But um, so what is the plans for it going forward? Are you just like, I mean, is this just for lockdown? Is this just for the pandemic? Are you, are you just going to, are you going to keep working through with them? Um, well, I think I, well, I'm definitely going to keep working through with them. I, they bring me so much joy to make that I can't not do them now. Like it just, it, it's almost like it hurts my hands when I'm not doing them. <clears throat> mm -hmm. I don't know if that makes any sense, but um, I really want to make a couple awesome puppets, none such puppets, so I can, larger scale, so I can do more of a, uh, a Sesame Street type thing, because I really like to try doing a little none such show where we read stories, and, um, you know, we've got all these these children who are having to go through this lockdown, and one of the things that, um, in, including play that, like, kids use to kind of work through what they're feeling, um, storytelling is also kind of a way that we we've always traditionally you know, um, ed, like given assurances and taught the next generation. So I do not have children of my own. All my children are my nuns, such as. And so I feel like this is kind of a good opportunity to sort of offer something to those kids to, um, you know, <clears throat> give, I would love to be able to give the same sort of um, feeling to future generations that like Fraggle Rock and the Dark Crystal and the Labyrinth and all those Jim Henson creations gave to me and to also just sort of give what comfort I can to sort of like contribute to, you know, like, hey, I'm hoping that it will get the trauma out, you know, there's gonna be a lot of it. Um, and the one thing we know is like generational trauma like causes lots of problems. It causes addiction issues, mental health problems and you know, it affects kids' well-being. So it's like, if we can just sort of focus on helping that, then maybe we can avoid future problems. You know, what? I mean, if it doesn't work, fuck me too, right? But like, you know, yeah. like, but if it does. <laughs> if it doesn't work, you still created none such as men, you know? But there's so. some like none such as either way. So I mean, it, come see, come saw, either way, I'm making none such as. It's a win-win. <laughs> you look at it any way you want, it's a win-win. You created a brand new thing that now exists in the world called a nun such. Now, mm -hmm. if it ends up going and bringing peace to someone else, amazing. But you still created something, and that is the whole point of it. But like on mm -hmm. the subject of nun such is the books, where can, where can they be found? They can be ordered off of my website at littlemissrisk.ca. If you just go to the front page, there is... A place where you can order the books as well as uh, some posters, some other odds and sods and ephemera. <laughs> What's this? Is this a just what, what was that last thing? Ephemera, just uh, general odds and sods of uh, weird okay. merch, self, self promotional merch, I suppose I could say, but things I've done, things I've been involved in, stuff I'm selling on my website. So it's like 
helping out the artists as well as there's some ready to adopt none such as there too so if anybody's looking for a little lockdown buddy or would like to order a custom one then they are always able to do that through me don't want it to be so we can have one you're saying huh yes Pugs yeah. could actually have a little guy you could oh actually i wonder if my, my hmm. box is right here and maybe oh fuck it's frank <laughs> oh fuck it's frank, oh, frank. <laughs> look at him man Hi, oh. Frank. Yeah, Frank's doesn't know how awesome. to do it. Yeah, Frank. Frank. Yeah, it's Zoom. I love it. Yeah, no, no, like no, the, 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 you can't have Frank. You can't have the kitten filter. No, Frank. Frank. No. Sorry. Come to me, Frank. <laughs> <laughs> Come be with the tubs. <laughs> but I know. Yeah. But yeah. So anyway, look, go check out the, the website, man. Tristan has and done has done and and is just an awesome creator and and just a very very talented person and thank you you know i love you at the bits man you know i love what you do and yeah. uh, frank frank you know, jesus see, frank he's trying to hijack your interview tristan this is I what know. he's doing like you know <laughs> this, isn't that what it is you create them and then slowly they take over story of my life and, and they, they come from the back into the front over time that's it's like real kids you know, you yep. create them and then they just take all your time and, 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 and jump in front of you. But um, God, I'm not paying all these guys' college. <laughs> so, like, I have before we, we ask you, know, like, uh, the final plans and we kind of like send you packing and so on, you know, and let you get back to your life. And um, I have two questions, that, two conversational pieces to throw in at the end. Um, because I, I feel I, I've played this game with one or two guests before and I feel it's in a really nice way to get to know, you know, the person. Um, so right off the bat, you can I'll ask you and you can ask me. Um, top three favorite Disney films of all time. It's random, but it it says a lot. Okay, um, I would say Little Mermaid, uh, The Great Mouse Detective, and Pete's Dragon. Wow, the old. Yeah, I would have went with, I mean, I, Little Mermaid, I kind of figured that would be in there somewhere, but at the other two, I was kind of going, ah, yeah. So I'll give you my first two, and then you have to try guess, because it's a weird one. Um, Aladdin is my third favorite. Mm -hmm. You love me some Aladdin. Um, the Lion King. Mm -hmm. And what do you, Tristan Risk, think is my favorite Disney film of all time? The Black Cauldron. Beauty and the Beast. Oh shit! Yeah, more romance, less less death lord. I do not know what it is about that movie. I just love the crap out of it, and I have done it's since beautiful. I was a kid. Yeah, Dude, it's, it's so beautiful. Good. It's, it's, so it's good. inside a mystery. That that was a beautiful age for Disney animation. Like, a, I know why you love it. It's a beautiful story. It's, it's and it, and it's it is. But I mean, I I love asking that question because I, the reason I do it is because you know, like people when they meet you, they never like. I mean, I would have figured. Um, you're the little mermaid because you know if there's an interest in mermaids and I'm thinking well maybe a little mermaid is in there but I wouldn't have guessed the other two so that's for me I'm like that's cool the so great mouse that. is tied for like is tied with uh, the rescuers because I don't know if you ever saw the rescuers the OG uh, one yeah. with Madame Medusa with her two giant crocodiles if that isn't like eerily looking into my own future I don't know what is <laughs> <laughs> I was like Huh, I really vibe with her for some reason. Hmm. Good for her. And it's the connections that you base off of cartoons because I, to this day, I'm not even joking, I call them my downtime because do you know when you get those days where you just had it like a long day and then you go to like throw on a movie, but your brain has no capacity at all to like focus on that movie or take any of it in. So you're kind of going, mm -hmm. so yeah. I will throw on. Like I would throw on the gummy bears. Do you remember those bears? Yeah. Oh my yeah, god, the, the gummy bears. Season. Oh and god, Tailspin, Darkwing Duck. The Disney Afternoon oh, was was my childhood. Disney so. Disney Plus has brought back a lot of people's childhood to them without even realizing it. They just switch it on and go, "Oh my god, what the hell? Screw the kids! I'm watching this." And that's yeah. basically we're, what has happened. We're like, now. kids, kids, we're gonna watch Watcher in the Wood or Mr. Boogity, and your kids are like, "Oh my god, this, what's wrong with you? Why are we watching this?" Like I, I remember I did do that. I actually made them sit down and watch Darkwing Duck, and they were like, "We and um, they love Ducktales now." Of all of things, they do love Ducktales. Ducktales um, is awesome, though. It's classic. In one of the twins, one of my twins, Bet she will sit there and watch the eighties Ducktales all day long for you. But um, 
when I put on like Darkwing Duck and things, they're looking at me stupid, going like, like what is this? Like, you know, why isn't this like 3D animated? And I'm like, well, this is a awesome, you know, this is what character needs to be. Old and Back nostalgic, the you know? <laughs> yes, and I love it. Because as, yeah. um, I think we've talked, we talked about it before. I think I think I had a conversation with you about this before. But, so you grew up in, in Canada, right? So you, mm -hmm. yeah. So as you yep. said, you've seen a lot of, and, and we, I think, well, I think we all know, even everything that they say is made in America is made in Canada. Let's not be fooled. You know, it's all in Vancouver. <laughs> but uh, yeah. Dawson's Creek, you grew up watching it, right? <laughs> I did not watch Dawson's Creek. Did not watch Dawson's Creek? <laughs> Oh my god, no. my information's wrong, people. Oh, no. oh my gosh, I, like I I that I was just like a grumpy little goth punk. Like I I probably if I'd seen those kinds of people in real life, I was uh, surly enough I would have taken a swing at them just like ah fuck you like little clean cut. <laughs> and it's funny too, Austin Creek is a place in British Columbia. Like it actually exists. Like I've been there. Is and it? it's like is everyone's it really like, like it is. it's just a random No Dawson was a frontier city, a colonial frontier city, um, and major trading post in the, uh, the up, upper region of our province. So, yeah, a little fun fact that it, there's actually a place called Dawson Creek, not Dawson's, but Dawson Creek. Wow. Okay, see, I love that because I did, I did not know that. And I got it wrong because no. I actually thought it was Dawson's Creek. You're like, what was the show you grew up on that you were obsessed with? Because that for oh. me, I would never admit it, but that was a show for me. Uh, Gem and the Holograms, it would have been Shira, Thundercats, uh, Sailor Moon when I got a bit older. Like I like I'm a hardcore cartoon lover. Like there's very few cartoons that I won't watch, but like I it I struggled to come over to like watch live action stuff. I'm like, oh it's not animated, I don't know, but do you find yourself as an adult still watching cartoons? Oh, I find absolutely. yourself in that room. I'm, I'm yeah. still like Anne yeah, I mean, Brian Reagan. Me uh, Brian Regan will text me sometimes, Tristan, right, at night times and stuff, and he'll be like, "What are you up to?" And I'm like, "What do you think <laughs> I'm doing?" He was like, "You're watching Batman again, aren't you?" Like the animated '90s cartoon. Oh, like, yes, yeah, I yeah. Know. I love it. It's, it's like my favorite cartoon of all time. Um, and and yeah. I'm like in my late thirties now, and I'm still just recommend it to anyone to go watch it. But um, yeah. So I mean, but it's it's like Netflix. It's the era of madness, and you rewatch yeah. things because as 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 I said about Dawson's Creek a while ago, I have actually gone back and rewatched Dawson's Creek <laughs> my older years. And it hasn't held up. But I mean, I still love the show because, look, let's be honest, it was, I, I was a filmmaker, he was a filmmaker, you know, Pacey was in the Mighty Ducks movies, I wasn't, but I loved those movies. Um, so it, it, I felt the right connection. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so looking back at it, I, I mean, God, the dictionary conversations, wow. It's... Yeah. Yeah, so I can totally see your point about like wanting to punch those people like when you were growing up because like my god I was like going Jesus did I speak like that when I was growing up because of this show I don't think I did because I grew up in, in a place called my ass where it, you know it, it's just everyone was like you know it was like sham kid and all that kind of stuff we, we, we designed our own lingo over there, um, mm -hmm. which is kind of the back end opposite of Dawson's Creek but um, yeah so I'm rambling out about Dawson's Creek here right <laughs> which I don't, I don't even know why because it's the madness of podcasts really but um, yeah so like since we were talking about all your stuff I just kind of feel it's probably the best way to end is ask you because we're stuck in the middle of a pandemic and we're you know you're in, you know, everything's kind of up in the air and we don't know kind of when it's going to go away or if it's ever going to go away but we're hopeful it will um, what does the future hold for, for Tristan Risk and where do you see like the path going uh, well, I mean, there's a lot of twists and turns ahead in immediate film fu uh, immediate film future. There's uh, a few films that we're looking at, seeing if it'll it'll get made with like with or without the corona. What's going on there? <clears throat> I'm hopeful, but we'll see. I can't. I, one thing 2020 has taught me is you can't put too much. Uh, stock into one thing and hope that pans out it's uh you've got to kind of have realistic expectations given the situation of things but I would probably also say that I also am looking forward to creating more none such as more ambitious none such as maybe hand animated none such as eyebrows eyebrows and um you no. know <laughs> oh yeah my eyebrows are moving about <laughs> 
uh, about that. I have um, some fun to drop in the future. And then also, um, yeah, potentially, who knows, if I get tired of acting and I want to switch over to just voice acting, I might get some facial modifications that can guarantee I can never work again as an actor and uh, promise me um, freedom to be the best darn voice actor ever. Wow. I mean, so come here, voice actors, and you've done, like, you've done ADR work in movies and stuff, you know, in actual you do, and that, that's not an easy game. You know what I mean? It's, it's a, a fun very game. different process, it's, it's, but it's <laughs> but you know I do find I mean I've I've never I've never voice acted, but I know a couple of people that have, and and they've they've said it to me that it's very different process. It's very it's a lot harder than people would actually you know, um realize. But knowing you and knowing the way you were, I I don't think that challenge would be anything for you. You would find a way to get in there and figure it out, anyways. You know. A big fan of uh, Manifest Destiny, so I just say I'm putting it out there by saying, oh, it would be nice to transition into that, and then I can get those face tattoos I've been wanting. I, 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 face tattoos or face modifications? What about yes. are we talking? Or are we just not yeah. talking about it right now, so we're just going to see what the future holds? Is, but that's the question I asked. It, it is. There's, there's like, I mean, there's all kinds of things that I can do with my face from conventional beauty to not conventional beauty. So uh, depending on which way 2021 falls, we'll see which way my face goes. I mean, I turned 40 this year, so I'm like, well, I didn't get that boob job. I, yeah, right? I'm like, oh, Why? I should get a boob job or something. And I'm like, eh, I don't have money for that. Fuck it. But, that's I mean, why I want to wrestle again. Like, I want to wrestle before I turn 40 because I, I know the body's going to break down. When's your birthday? What, what month are you? Oh, it was, oh, November 2nd. It was my birthday, so 1980. I, I am the eldest of the millennials. So you just turned 40? Yeah. So happy 40th birthday to you. I thought you meant it was this year. I mean, like, as in turning this year, I'm, I'm 40 in December. Oh, yeah. No, I'm going to be Before Christmas Day. Oh, it was, yeah. It, it just... was babies, Tristan. I was yeah, one of those yeah. babies that, like, got one present, one big present, and told, oh, that's for your birthday and Christmas, you know? So, yeah, or else, like, you know, everyone's, like, else in your grade is, like, a year older than you, and they're, like, yeah, blah, blah, blah. I'm, like, I wasn't, like, I wasn't that age yet. I wasn't there. November baby. Scorpio. November and December <laughs> babies, man. I'm telling you, they're, they're, it just goes to show when, you, when you're born, there's creative stars looming in the distance, man. That's where, and, and it ends up shooting you in the foot, man. You know, <laughs> as it's look, a happy lunch. It is, it is. Come here and look. I absolutely wish you the best in everything you do because you know yourself. You've met me before, and you know I'm I'm a massive fan of what you do. You know, and I've Thank and you. I love and and I do do genuinely. I mean this wholeheartedly. I'm so happy that like after years of like seeing your stuff and and and, and getting to work with you on screen, and then you know over time and actually getting to call you a, an actual friend, which is the is the cool part of this gig and the whole thing of just meeting people, you know, you get to actually become friends with the people that you're like, oh my God, look who that is. So, um, yeah, so I mean, like, moving forward, Tristan, it's going to be like an interesting year, as you said, you know, and we'll see where it goes. But thank you so much for coming on the show. I've Thanks really, for having me. I've really, really loved talking to you. Like, I mean, as I said, I've, I've enjoyed it so much. I didn't even call for stop halfway through. I just kept this thing going because it was such an interesting yeah. conversation. But I think we should end it with um with a phrase from a, from a movie, you know. Totally, um, Frank. Jesus. Frank. Yeah. See. Damn it, Frank. Him to my house. I'll start him out. <laughs> <laughs> but um, because you know, as you said yourself, it all depends on twenty twenty one, and now, and everyone's kind of up in the air with the whole COVID and the pandemic and everything else, and nobody really knows kind of one hundred percent where things are going to go and where you know how things are going to fare out, and people are kind of in weird mindsets and and stuff. So I think we should quote something from a movie that I think I love very much, but I think you do too. And it's from The Crow. It can't rain all the time. Cannot rain all the time. And it shan't rain all the time, Tristan, right? Because the sun will rise up and we will all have smiles and hugs yet again. And that is my, my wish for 2021. That to hug a real person outside of my bubble. Yep. Yeah. First that bubble. <laughs> yeah, man. <laughs> but yeah, so... um. Yeah, look, Mir, as I said, thank you so much. As always, I would I would talk to you every day of the week if I could, Tristan. But you know, as I said, we are in crazy times and we all have lives and so on. And so we see oh, whenever we get these moments of just chat and chill, it, it's really cool. For I think it's good for the mind as well. 
really Absolutely. just have conversations because I think that's what was lacking in the last year was people going mental because they couldn't have you know like outside conversations. But uh, yeah, look, if you ever want to come back on the show again, my promise to you is I will let you choose the topic, and we will banter <laughs> about it. But, um, I will take you up on that threat sometime. <laughs> whenever you get time, and if you come up with something meaty that you want to talk about, want to ask me questions about, you you come back on. But in the all process right. of it all, this has been the Twisted Tubs podcast. I am your host, Stephen Tubbley, a.k.a. Twisted Tubs. She is the ever, ever, ever amazing Tristan Risk, a.k.a. Little Miss Risk. Thank you so much for coming on. Tristan, it has been an absolute pleasure. Show those thumbs up because we're going to say goodbye to them and we're going to smile.